about time to get started tonight. We'll probably have some folks running behind. I know uh, seen some of the emails come out. Uh, Dave or some of the things shot out to the news group there. Dave was running behind. He said North End had a bad accident, so uh, he may not even be able to show up. But uh, we'll just move through the lesson. Hopefully they'll be able to get in here and catch up. Before we uh, get started, let's go ahead and go to God in prayer. God, our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the time that we can come out with saints of like precious faith and just open up your word and try to learn from it, try to get direction in our lives that, that we can only get from you. We know that it's not in our own way to, to lead our own lives, and we're, we recognize that. We know that you are the creator and maker of all things, and you have a will and a design for us to follow. We just pray that we'll be submissive to that in our lives. We, we are mindful of the folks who aren't able to be out with us here tonight. And some of them are on the roads at this time. Some of them home in bed, not, not doing too well. So we pray for all of them and ask that you will be with them, comfort them, help that the uh, situation would change, that they would be able to be out with us at the next important time. We just ask your blessing on us tonight as we enter into this study. Bless our efforts here and help us to gain as much as we can out of this and, and pray that you'll be with the teachers down the hall and all the kids in those classrooms as well, that, that things will go well and they'll open, have open hearts and open minds to your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We've been uh, studying, we're about halfway through this study, maybe a little, little further than halfway, I guess. Tonight, the topic that uh, we're going to talk about is materialism in a spiritless World. I thought that was uh, an interesting way of phrasing, phrasing that. Um, when you think of spiritless, something that's, that's, you know, we want to be spiritual. We don't want to be spiritless. So uh, this is not something we want to happen to us. And this term that we're looking at here tonight, and we're even going to look at it, I think, a little bit next week, and it's come up throughout our whole study it's a very dangerous um, thing that can creep up on you. We'll notice that tonight. It, it sometimes happens uh, even in spite of yourself. So this is something we want to guard ourselves against. That's the reason we've been having this study and trying to, uh, hopefully you, you've appreciated going clear back to the beginning of the time and looking at God's view on, on how he looked at money and the use of money and, and where it should rank in your life. And uh, a term keeps coming up um, when we've been talking about this is balance. Remember last week we, we brought that up, balance in your life. And when we think about this, I think we want to, to keep remembering that. We want to have the right balance that God wants us to have. And so when we think about that, what are we talking about when, we, when we're talking about, about, about balance in our life in regards to this? What did we say last week? It's a matter of having your priorities right, right? So that's, that's actually the key to this, this study. You have to have your priorities right. If we, if we get that out of, out of whack, and that's what this term materialism is all about. They get this thing turned completely around and they, they put their, all of their expectations on a certain thing and it's, it's, it's materialistic things. And what do we learn that happens to those things? Perish. They perish, right. It, it's, it, it, we talked about the money. You remember, it doesn't matter how much money you had, in the end, it just all flies away. It's, it's gone. It's gone. So it, it's pretty interesting terms that are used in God's Word to, to talk about this and try to give a, get us a, a visual um, concept of it. But it's something we need to take really serious because um, in, the, in the long run, if this is where you're putting all your emphasis and this is where you're putting all your priority on I, I got to make x amount of dollars i got to have all this i got to have all that to get by in life uh, you got your priorities they're out of whack and according to god and according to, to all these scriptures that we've been looking at uh, that's going to be a bad situation to be in in judgment day so let's think about that and think about the spiritless view of the world and how they end up and how sometimes we end up drawing the same conclusion and, and ending up in that same place. 
So the, the one of the key verses that we've been talking about is there in Matthew, the sixth chapter. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So that, that verse kind of encapsulates everything we, we want. In, 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 if we're just going to put it in, in one verse, what's this lesson all about? What are we trying to get at? That's it. Seek the kingdom of heaven first. Priority number one. God, God doesn't ask to be second place. He demands to be first place. So if we can keep that in our mind and, and keep that in our focus throughout all these things, that's, that's going to be good for us. And um, anybody else have some thoughts on that that we kind of flushed out last week and some of the things that, that Dave brought out throughout the class? I know we're going to keep some of these things we just keep reiterating, but it, there, it's because... We need to. Repetition. We need that repetition to get it drove into our mind. But let's just think about this verse here. And this verse will come up even later on in the lesson. But seek God first, His kingdom, and all these things will be added unto you. What things was he talking about in that context, by the way? You remember? The material things, the needs, the things that we talked about is food and, and clothing and raiment, all those things that we, we look at as being true needs in our life. And so we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit as well. There's another verse that, that pops up there that really should be a key verse for us as well. In 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, you know, verses 9 and 10, it said, But they that will be rich fall into temptations, a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lust, which drowns men in destruction and perdition. So this is a situation we don't want to be in. For the love of money, not money, but the love of money, is the root of all evil, which while some covet after, they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So what, what, are, we, what are we seeing in, in these few verses right here? What, what, what would we categorize these verses? If we're thinking this is something from God, what is this? This is a warning. This is God telling us, be careful. You know, these things here, you don't want to be in this category here. The rich, you know, they, people who are rich, this is the type of things that happen to them. And so, um, I, I like what the writer says there. He says, for the, you know, the word... He says, desire to be rich. He says, harmful lust, love of money. It's, it's greediness. It's covetous. It's just destruction. Perdition. Perdition. I, I had to look it up. I went, <laughs> I've heard that word a few times. And I said, what, what exactly does it? It's a state of eternal punishment. Who? Raise your hand if you want to be in a state of eternal punishment. Nobody. Nobody wants to be in a state of eternal punishment. So that's why we need to take this very serious, isn't it? We don't want to put our priority on, on the love of money and, and, and be a greedy type person who desires all these things. And if, if you're this type of person, um, what are you doing in your life? How would this play out, practically speaking, in somebody's life? What would we see? Selfishness. Selfish. Selfish. Right. We would just see a reversal of, of the priorities, right? Of the God priorities. God wouldn't be first, would he? Maybe, maybe he's second. Maybe he's third. Maybe he's fourth. You know, who, knows, who knows how far. Once you take God out of first place, which is where he's demanding to be, where, where does he drop to? Does he automatically go to second? Last place. <laughs> probably, probably clear to last. Right. That's probably right. Because that's what we're going to see happens to the, the mindset that a materialistic person, somebody who really falls into this and is, is well grounded in it, that's what it is. It's, it's, uh, they do away with God. I didn't check my phone to see if I turned it off, but I heard somebody, <laughs> somebody's phone. Someone check mine right now. Uh, uh, 
I got people sending me texts all the time. All right. Okay, so uh, last week Dave brought up um, something in class, and this came up. And um, let's let's go back. I think it was was it Matthew there where it talked about the sixth chapter where it talked about the. Well, I'll just go ahead and uh, paraphrase what it was. When we talk about needs and wants, we we started to kind of flush that out a little bit. And so, um, does God? Now let, let's think about this practically speaking because sometimes we know what it says and we know God promises to take care of all of our needs but he doesn't say anything about um, he doesn't say anything about our wants in, in, a, in the context that we talked about that last week but um, in reality how many of us have wants all of us no we all we all have needs as well and so we're, we're striving to to meet those needs but we also have wants there's things i want there's things you want is it wrong for us to want certain things and and, and strive to have those things now it, it can be if we if we get it we get turned around we get twisted around and we put that we put that up at the top of the list, it definitely can be. But if we, if we keep God in His place, and He's number one, and we're doing things, we're making sure that we're living a, a God-filled life, we're, we're God-centered. We, we have God at the center of our lives, and we're looking to support the work of the church. We're looking to support men overseas, uh, men right here that are preaching and teaching and, and taking care of our families. Are we allowed to take care of our wants as well? Ecclesiastes talks about yeah. it's good for a man to work, not only to feed, but to enjoy the fruits of his labors. Enjoy. That goes right. beyond just, well, I'm glad I got my needs met. It, go, it, it goes into, no, I get to have some things that I enjoy in life. And it's, <coughs> it's whether or not we, we use those blessings to further our work in God. That, that I'm so thankful you provide for me not only what I need, but what I want. And provide my family for not only what they need but what they want. So thanks for taking care of us. But as long as like like you're talking about, you don't let that be the focus. Instead of uh, praising the things that you're getting and focusing on the things that you're getting that you want, some people, materialistic people, they they're just so happy they got it, and that's it. They're not they're not happy that somebody gave that to them or provided it for them or uh, caused that to happen. And we know, of course, God He provides every blessing, and a good thing comes from Him. So. Yeah, and I, I think that's an important point because they, as we're going to see with, with some of the, he brings out some of the thinking with some of these folks is they take God out of that equation. And that's how they end up with that mindset anyway. So you, you have to remove God before you really become truly materialistic and you're, you're given over to that holy. But the, the, the verse Jake is talking about is Ecclesiastes 2.24. It said, there's nothing better for a man that he should eat or drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. So eat and, eat and drink and, and make your soul enjoy the good in his labor. There's, there's advantages to getting out and working and, and, and making a living. Yeah, you're doing what God told you to do. You're providing for your family. You're taking care of those things that you need to take care of. You're able to give to the church. You're able to help folks who are in need that's that's all high priority stuff that's top priority that that goes right up here with keeping god first but after that uh if you're able to have things enjoy things you want to buy a new car you want to upgrade and move into a different house that's that's on you but keep in mind when you make moves like that don't do it without keeping God in every part of that decision. Because as you move into that, you can become a slave to that. And that's what we, that's what we want to guard ourselves against. We don't want to move from a house here that we could afford, and I was making a payment on real easy, and now I move into a house that now I have to work. I have to be a slave. I'm, I'm a slave to it. Go ahead. Someone on this, uh, thinking about that, also there's a lot of people like, 
you might um, get another job offer, and it's a really good job offer, but the very first thing on the list is not finding to see if there's a really good congregation there that you can join yourself to. They, they put that like last on the list, yeah. and that's not where it should be yeah. before you make that decision. That, that's exactly right. Yeah, I've, I've seen people tell you, I'm moving to Phoenix, and you say, well, is there a good congregation? Well, I don't know. I'll figure that out when I get there. <laughs> you should have thought about that before you moved there because not every place you move in this country has good sound congregations. You make a decision to move out to Wyoming or you know, somewhere out there, you might be driving three hours to get to a congregation. So make sure you, you that's, that's what I was, I guess that comes right back to what I was talking about. Make sure you keep God in your decision making process. And so we, we flushed out last week that and the week before that this all comes back to motive and desire. And so it's, it's our motive, our desire. We want to make sure that we have the right motive when we're doing things and, and, and have the right kind of desire. We don't want to let these things con control us. And it, it can definitely control you. So those are some of the things that, that this guy brings out. And I thought it was really good just, just reading through his material. Um, we've swallowed the idea that to be well off, uh, the idea to be well, one must be well off is the way he, he puts it. And that's true. A lot of folks, um, they teach that, well, how, how, how good are you? How are you doing? You know, and you say, well, I'm doing good. But you're measuring it by how well off am I? Is, you know, is that what you're using as your barometer? So, you know, let's, let's don't do that because money is not the measuring stick for happiness. We can, we can have not, not so much money and have true happiness, have, have a great family, have a great church family here, a great support unit, and, and, and that means more than money. Did you have... you got to get my attention sometimes. <laughs> Go ahead, Ruth. Uh, I was just uh, running, uh, running my mind. People uh, really like to play the lottery. Yeah. And they spend a lot of money to be in that lottery. And I had a cousin that was, uh, they won a lottery and quite a bit of money. I don't know how much. But you know that ruined their whole lives. She wound, they wound up getting a divorce and it just, I mean, it was like just a big problem and wow. just think ahead it always is nice to have a ton of money that you just come into you don't even know what you're doing and i don't know just uh it just doesn't i just soon stay poor yeah <laughs> and, and so we, we yeah we, we discussed that sometimes you know in the middle of the road's better you know, I, I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be poor. <laughs> Just, you know. Uh, Sometimes I think it's better to be poor. Yeah. Well, that's that's true. Yeah. Yes. And so as he moved through this material, he, 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 he took us to an area here. And maybe you haven't heard of this. And that's that's our next slide there. This word here, affluenza. Has anybody affluence? I you say that. Have you heard of this term being used? I've seen it used in a when somebody had a court defense have you ever where they had kids that committed crimes and then they they used have you ever heard that used in that yeah so they they claimed that they were victims of this uh, you know a affluent home that they came from caused him to be like this so in this material he talked about that well the the true term itself is a psychological malaise supposedly affecting wealthy young people Listen to this now. The symptoms of which include a lack of motivation. Well, that hit about two-thirds of them out there. <laughs> uh, a feeling of guilt, okay? And then a sense of isolation. So this being well-off or being affluent uh, causes these folks to have all these things pop up. And this guy brings up some, some good information. He said the children show the symptoms uh, uh, like poverty, you know, they have depression, they have anxiety, loss of meaning. It's worse than, than poverty is what he brings out. And despair of the future. They, you would think nobody like this would be worrying about the future. Their future is set. Mom and dad are, are filthy rich. They're taking care of them. 
But look at some of the things that these, these people uh, have to deal with. Like Charlotte mentioned, in the gross selfishness. Uh, cravings to be more or better. Insubstainable cravings. So they're not able to achieve uh, the level of success that they want to, to, lead, to achieve. Uh, a life rationale begins with the elimination of God. This life rationale begins with... Elimin elimination of God. Why is that? Because what, what does God demand? He's first. He's first place. So if you're going after the almighty dollar and you're seeking that and you want to put that in first place, well, you have to move God out of that slot. And so that's what he talks about here. So at, at its logical conclusion, there's nothing better than this material world. And that's what they see. So that's that's what they're focused on. If I can get if I can get me a new car, if I can get that Mercedes, if I could get me this four hundred thousand dollar house, if I could get this, you know. So they, they put all those goals out there that are pretty high standards to achieve. It demands a lot of work, demands a lot of time, and even though these folks have a lot of things given to them, this if you're affluent. And that's, that's what he talks about. But the thing I want us to see is to achieve these things, you have to take God out of the equation. You don't reach this level here at, without God being out of your life most of the time. So that's the thing that uh, he talks about. It's a society where people know the price of everything and the value of nothing. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good way of putting it. The price of everything and the value of nothing. I know that car is going to cost me forty thousand dollars, but do you? How, you know, when you ask them to place a value on that. So, you know, what what's a, a good rule of thumb? I've heard this before when you're when you're out shopping for something, and uh, we're we're going to talk about this a little later. I guess I should <laughs> should wait to bring it up, but it just popped in my mind. What what's a good thing to do when you look at something? You're out there and you say, "I got to have that." I don't care whether it, it was clothes or, huh? Count the cost. Say it louder. Count the cost. Count the cost, okay. How do you do that? What's, what's some... Ask yourself if you really need that. Walk away from it. Okay. What, what do some people do? Have you ever heard this, Alan? Uh, they got a philosophy. If you, if you can wait, how long? A lot, a lot of people say if you go 10 days, just, you know, you look at that... Thing, I gotta have that, you know. That's the nicest suit I've ever seen. I'd look so good in that, I gotta have it. <laughs> I just, now, this isn't me talking because I could care less. But <laughs> that's not my uh, niche, you know. But so, uh, just okay, hold that thought and just leave, you know. And then if, 10 days later, if you feel the same way about that, then maybe you go buy the thing. But a lot of times, we make decisions just. On the, you know, on the whim. I got to have it. I got a credit card here in my pocket. I can buy that. I can buy two or three of those things if I, if I want to. You know? so, and that's, that's the way we act sometimes. But is that the right way to act? That's, that's not good, is it? So just because we can, just because maybe we're close to what he talks about here being more affluent, uh, there's harmful things and dangerous things that, that come as a result of that. So let's be careful because at the end result of this, he brings out here rejection of reason, reasoning and objective truth, rejection of objective morality, and rejection of personal responsibility. These folks aren't responsible for nothing. They want everybody to wait on them hand and foot. There's no personal responsibility here. They, they want to be served then they feel like they're in a position where they, they can be served. And so they, they, um, they raise their children up on this, like this. It says, this makes an assault of materialism on the home all the more pronunciable. Again, another word I had to look up. Harmful or damaging. So, so uh, we can become so affected by materialism that we cannot even recognize it. When objective truth and morality as defined by God's word are set aside, who will take personal responsibility nobody when you set God's word aside that dictates all of those things that puts all of those 
parameters in there, who's going to dictate what's right or wrong? Those people make up their own mind. So that's, that's interesting that he, that he brings a lot of this up. I, I thought it was very good. The, the point that I thought was very concerning for us, if you look over on page 55 at the top of the page there, he said the typical person, even the average Christian, does not seem to know materialism when he sees it. Now, we need to stop and think about this. Because now he's talking about us. Okay? Wouldn't he know it when you've seen it a lot of times, at least in his own life? And here's the, here's the, that's the kicker right there. A lot of times we look out at somebody else and say, that guy, he's too materialistic. You know, he, he's got a new car. His wife's got a new car. They just bought this new house. They buy whatever they want. They, I could live off the crumbs that fall off of their table. You know, so <laughs> he's too materialistic. So you, you can recognize it in somebody else's life. You know, we're, we're easy. That's easy to do. And it's also, you know, no matter how rich you are, you know, financially, you know, you can see poor people are just as materialistic as rich people. Exactly. I mean, it doesn't really matter. And of course, like, you know, that's not what we're talking about right now, but you're right when, until you actually stop and look in the mirror and say, well, what do I have? And I remember, um, it was recently I read something that said the average person has over 100,000 different things and just random things, you know. And when you start to add it up, it's like, yeah, it's probably pretty close to it. Just random objects. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just great. We, we have to have storage facilities just to store the stuff. That we can't even use yeah. it for two years. Yeah, Wilson Adams, when he was here, he, he talked about that. And when he said it, you know, you heard the chuckles all around the room. You know, how many people have a storage unit out in your backyard? Everybody's kind of, everybody kind of chuckles, you know, because we're all, you know, we're all dealing with that kind of thing. I don't have room in the house to put all that stuff. So I get me one of those little things, put it out in the driveway or out in the backyard. Maybe you buy one, put it out in the backyard. That way you don't have to rent it. You know, then you fill it up. Go ahead, Jay. Something that I can see myself <coughs> falling prey to is if we, if we get used to this uh, idea of slots and God at the top, and, and so he's first and then everything else is second, third, whatever. Um, that I, especially me, I compartmentalize very well and sometimes too well. Um, I think a lot of guys can do that, but anybody, if they really want to, they can compartmentalize. And I think that that's dangerous for us to think like that because if we say, okay, God's first, then we can say, okay, so I, I put God first in my life by, okay, I did this and I did this and I did this for God. I prayed, I gave, I did this, and I attended, I served. All right, now I can be materialistic because that's number two, or that's number three, or that's number 50. It doesn't matter. Now I can tend to this. But really what we need to be thinking of is God's not just first. He's also second and third. He's everything. He needs to be in every aspect. He needs a trickle down. He needs to have a trickle down effect in our life so that yeah. when we get into all these other areas of our life, it's not strictly, you know, a you know, Bible or what we see in the Bible. God has to affect all those things. Because you, you don't have, okay, that's my God time. Your life is your God time. So all those other things need to be infected almost or, or have areas and pockets of God in them. We need to have God in all mm -hmm. of those. So it's not just a slot thing, I don't think. It could be, yeah. but it needs to go down. Yeah, I guess, yeah. So that, that might might be a poor visual. I, I, I still, I mean, I do see the, the, the direction, you know, seek God first and then all these other things will be added to you. It's not a bad visual. God's going, God's going, to, God's going to take care of those things. And so he, he uses that analogy as, as the way he takes care of the birds and the, the natural habitat. You know, when you think about it, and then he compares all those things that he's taken care of to being even greater than Solomon in, in all of his beauty. And all, you know, we know about how much Solomon had. And he says, this, look at this little flower in the field. How beautiful that is, and how it, how easy it's taken care of by God. Go ahead, Seth. That first part of the definition of affluenza, when you talked about maybe the children of the wealthy that don't know the value of something, it reminds me of in, in athletics. There's a there's a similar thing that happens, and I have an example. Uh, about 18 to 20 years ago, there was a young man not far from here. He was six foot five as a freshman. He started at quarterback at Division I high school. He started in basketball, varsity basketball, as a freshman, six foot five as a freshman. He had never had to go up against anybody as big as him. 
all through his life. He was always bigger than everybody. He, by the time he was a junior in high school, he had an offer to go to Michigan. And his family liked Ohio State, so they said, no, don't take that. <laughs> so, Imagine that. So, but then by the end, Ohio State never offered. He ended up going to a small Mac school, and he never played. Because he, as he got higher and higher, he had never gone up against people his own size. And I feel like that's a little bit of a parallel to these people we're talking about that don't know the value of anything. They've never worked for it, so they can't comprehend it. Right. That's, that's good. Good point to bring out. Yeah, that if you're handed these things, they're not they're not going to have any sense of value for it, and so that they don't know what it's worth. That's that's good. Go ahead. It's interesting that Apostle Paul there in, in First Timothy a few verses up says godliness with content is great gain. Right. And I believe those things are foundational. The contentment comes after we try to be like God. Right. And that helps us keep all this in perspective. And then when we're content with what God gives us, that's that's the Luber kind of life, gratitude. Exactly. And I, I think it's good, like Jake says, don't don't drift away from that just because you covered that base. And you know, keep it keep it at the forefront of your life. We want to be God centered throughout all these things. But we definitely want to put God in, in first place. Did anybody have any comments over here? I, I look one way, might go ahead, Alan. And it's always said you can't take it with you. Uh, why do you need all of this? Uh, and sometimes it's kind of hard to understand it, but you first have to know the belief that God does exist and that there's no life after death except heaven. If you don't do that, you need more help. That's right. That's right. Okay, and like Jeff mentioned, um, the, the writer brings up, brings that to our attention. Do you have to be rich to be materialistic? And and so that goes back to our, uh, the thing we brought out in our last page, motive. You know, what's our motive about things? You know, what's our desire? Uh, you, you don't have to be rich to have your motive out of whack and still say, I, I got to do this or I got to do that and, and, and get your priorities uh, out of whack there. So uh, the poor can fall in this as well. For the majority, materialism is a problem of sin of someone else. So when we think about that, that's what we were talking about. You can, you can look at somebody else and see it, but the reason we're talking about it here in, in this class, the reason we decided to, to delve into this is so we could all look in the mirror and look at ourselves. So if you've been looking at everybody across the room, say, well, they, they are better off than me or... <laughs> but put the mirror right in front of your face and start looking back in the mirror because that's what we're wanting to do. Okay, so there's some evidences of materialism all around us. He, he brings these out, uh, even though we might not recognize it. Look at some of the things that happen that are evidence of this, at this growth of gambling. We see gambling, how it's growing and growing. Like Ruby said, it, there's every gas station now is a, casino <laughs> nearly you know i mean you can't go in there i go in to pay for gas and i'm waiting on you know six people that's this is a lotto line if you want the gas line go around there i said well i didn't know there was different lines here <laughs> but uh it's it's interesting that what we're in uh our greedy state government so they've switched from policing the numbers racket to operating the numbers racket <laughs> and that's about the truth sometimes and some states are worse than others but that, that's where this is just where we're going as a society upsurge in bankruptcies how many people file bankruptcy all the time do christians ever file bankruptcy yeah that's a problem that's a problem because that, that goes against some god-based principle divorce crisis another thing that we looked at uh, primarily when people it says here when both Spouses focus primarily on making money. There's very little time to please each other or to take care of each other. And few marriages survive this inattention. So we talked about this material thing, this material, being materialistic. We think, well, this is just about money. No, look, look at all these things and all the areas of your life that are affected by your view on money. You know, you, you could get a divorce. Uh, sleep disorders, people financially stressed, 
have a hard time sleeping. Or if they got a lot of money sitting in their safe, they're worried about somebody breaking in and taking their money from <laughs> out of their safe. So those are the types of things that, that people do. Um, they have bad giving patterns because they start thinking, well, I'm not going to worry about giving all this to the Lord because I have this, I want to get this, I'm going to buy me a new shotgun this next Saturday. And, you know, and everything starts taking the priority thing. Creation of new class of orphans. This is a very, uh, uh, this should hit us pretty hard. Millions of latchkey children. What's a latchkey kid? They go to a center instead of going home. Right. Somebody else take. Somebody else is raising them, right? Right. That's not the way that God set this up. So latchkey kids, and so they come home to empty homes. Uh, parents shuffle them from one place to another, and they're like orphans. Uh, abortion, murder of unborn babies, another thing. Folks say, "Hey, I don't have time. I don't have time for a kid. I'm pregnant. Well, I got to take care of that. We get an abortion." I'm affluent, you know, I have enough money. Let's go pay for that. Get rid of this problem. That's, so those are the types of things. Euthanasia, another one. These folks are getting too old. They're a problem. They're a drain. My budget is going, you know, <laughs> hey, I was planning on inheriting a lot of money from that person. If they stick around much longer, I'm not going to get all that money. So this euthanasia thing comes in. And they say, hey, they're not a productive part of society anymore. Slip them a couple pills here and, you know, say goodbye. And that's, that, this is the way people think. And so, you know, it's, it's, nothing to, it's nothing to joke about. Depression, hectic hysteria, social isolation. Remember we talked about the isolation that comes about as a result of this. Uh, upsurge in compulsive buying. Like I mentioned, that you have the money, you got credit cards, you just go buy it. In the Disneyland Gospel, he said, God wants us to be physically rich, wealthy, equate with spiritual wealth. So he, they, they, you know, they think you're healthy, wealthy, and wise. All, 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 you know, they teach that all the time. That this, you know, Christians should all be wealthy. So they talk about that a good bit in their preaching. But that's not what we see when we look into God's Word. Jesus talks about materialism. We're, we're always running out of time in this class. He talks about materialism there in Luke. He said, He spake the parable unto them, the ground of a certain rich man bought forth plenty. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room to bestow my fruits. Somebody brought this out last week. Look how many times people mention I when they're talking about these things. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns, I'll build greater, and there I will bestow all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast good laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said, Thou fool, this night thou soul is required of thee. Then who's those, who should those things be that you have provided? Whose are they going to be? Somebody else. Somebody else is going to benefit from all that hectic, hard work effort this guy put into that stacking up all this treasure he didn't did he get to take any of it with him no he leaves it all behind for somebody else and this is this is our life so we need to think about that this is what can happen to us you can get in this rat race that we're in just called life and we can get our priorities all out of whack and and we we become just like that he talked to, again about another parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And, and what do we know about that? We, we won't take time to read it. Who remembers that parable? The rich man and Lazarus. What's some things we see about the rich man? Did he take his wealth with him? No. No. Was he sorry after the fact? When we see that the parable play out there. What did he want to do? In telling people go back and warn them gotta go back and warn them look what look you know what what's coming why why did he want to go back and warn them what did he fail to see what did he do with god god was up here what did he do with him <laughs> took him off of that pedestal didn't he took him off of that spot so he realized what he had done he said i gotta go back and warn my my brother gotta warn my family 
you know, but he wasn't allowed to do that. And so he was told that, you know, they, they need to hear the prophets. So that kind of brings it full circle for us because um, you can't do that. You can't lay up treasures for yourself and not have treasures for God. So those are some of the things that I think that we need to, to keep in our mind. And there's some things here that he brought up here. He said, the Lord uh, went to the heart of the issue. What a person places as priority of treasure in their own life defines who or what they are. And I think Dave kind of brought that out. He said, open up your checkbook. Just look at what you've been spending your money on. <laughs> so that kind, of, that kind of hits us all a little bit. You say, why, why do you all want to do that? When you're spending your money on certain things, that's your priority of life. That's what you're interested in. So those are some things we need to think about. What about the excuse I need to make a living? You know, I, and we talked about this as well. Some folks say, well, I got to make a living. I, I can't be at church Sunday. I got I to gotta support my family. God doesn't pit himself against himself. If he's asking you to do something and he tells us that it's wrong for us to forsake the assembly of our saints together, and then we turn around and say, well, but he told me I have to make all this money to support my, myself, take care of myself, so I can't be there on Sunday because I have to do this. Are you really wanting to stand in judgment with that kind of logic in front of God? That's not going to cut it. So if we've been, if we've been using those types of things, we need to, we need to think about that and, and try to change. Uh, keep God first. Back to the scripture that we talked about. Uh, seek, seek Him first and everything's going to be all right. And we'll, we'll, we'll get through a lot better. I want to I want to get to this last page because on go to page fifty eight in the lesson material. This guy had some good conclusions. Spirituality does not preclude thought and work designed to provide for ourselves materially. So think about that now. It doesn't take place over that. The man who will not work and provide for his family is deemed worse than an infidel. Is this God? Pitting himself against himself? No, he's just laying out what's important in this life. Money is important. It's important that we have the right view of money. It's important that we get out there and make money, make a living. Don't fool yourself and think that, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit back and do nothing if this money is going to be that much of a burden. I don't want to make any of it. No, that's, that's the wrong conclusion. He says that you're worse than an infidel. If you don't provide for your own. Jesus rebuked any effort to, justif to justly justify such failure with some sort of fake spirituality. So sometimes people try to say I'm so spiritual that I'm not concerned about my physical well-being. That's foolishness. Utter foolishness. But you can't do that. And so who's going to take care of your family? Who's going to feed your children? Who's going to take care of your parents? Uh, he talked about here the, the number one neglect, the number of neglected parents in America suggests that material, materialism underlines such spiritual tomfoolery remains quite alive in the 21st century. So he talked about in that, that paragraph before there of not taking care of your mother, your father when they're in need. And we've seen that example of, in the Bible there where it talked about that. And they cond God condemns that. Christ condemned it when he was here. And even we look at Christ as, a, as an example like we do in everything else. And what did Christ leave us? It says the example of the Lord's instruction. He arranged from the cross to care for his mother. We don't have time to go to John 19, 25, and 27. But what, how did he do that? Do you remember? One of his disciples. Remember that? Was there? John, and he says, this is your mother, this is your son. From that point on, he was like a son to her. He made sure that his mom, his physical mom, was going to be taken care of. And he's going to be dead and gone. He's getting ready to give up his life. But he still had concern enough to take care of that. So he shows us an example of how we should act. With our family. Do we go through life and say, hey, when I'm dead and gone, she, she can do whatever she wants to do. I don't care. 
I don't care if she has enough money to put me in the ground. <laughs> That's not the right attitude, is it? That's not the attitude we see in the Bible. We see people concerned about taking care of, making sure their family's taken care of, making sure that they're doing what God wants you to do, making sure that you take care of your parents if the need arises, and you make sure that you look ahead even past the time that you're going to be here on this earth and some things being taken care of if you can at all do that. And that should be an example to all of us. And we should want to do it. Anybody have some other comments there that come to mind? Good class. We, uh, this, this material is pretty challenging. We've got we to gotta rush through it. It seems like we should split these lessons in half, I think. But anyway, hopefully we're getting something out of it. It's just a lot of material to cram into one class. Look forward to class next week.